Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Big Brian Cockrell. How are we, brother? Sam, uh, pleased to meet you, mate. Yeah, it's really good to see you, Brian. First yeah. of all, thanks for coming on the show. But thank you for having me on yeah, the show. Yeah, used to call you the tax man. That's correct. One of Britain's toughest men alive. <laughs> um, so they say. Yeah, <laughs> you've got a very colourful past. Yes. You've had over a thousand bare knuckle fights. Yeah, yeah, straight fights. Yeah, yeah. but we up to 24 stone at one point. You've yeah. had some serious charges from murder, attempt murder on police officers. You've just released a book called The Tax Man a few years back. Yep. You were in McIntyre's Underworld, Underworld yeah, documentary, yeah. which I actually seen. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, a, a yeah. good documentary. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've been addicted to crack, but the good thing is you've changed your life. That's right. You're doing good things, but we'll go right back to the start, Brian, that's, that's where fine. you grew up and how it all began. Right. Well, I grew up, I, I was born in the Court Bridge, not far from where you were. Yeah. Um, my, family, my family are all Scottish. And they came from Ireland originally, so that's where I've got that mad Celtic blood in me. Um, we came down to England to live, but I lived with my uncles, but they were more like brothers, you know. And I lived with them and I had that Scottish accent. And when I went to school in Hartlepool, I got bullied because I had dyslexia. I couldn't, I couldn't read and write properly as a kid, and I was always off school and things. I'd ask me, and uh, you got bullied because you had that accent, you know, like being Scottish. Yeah. So... I don't know what it's like being bullied, it's horrible. So I went to school there and then we left from that, that area. I went to another school, went to a special school for, for kids with special needs because I couldn't read and write properly. Uh, got called names there and bullied. And then I started fighting when I was 13. Uh, I watched things like The Hulk and used to fantasize. I wish I could be like him and I wouldn't get bullied. Or I watched Arnold Schwarzenegger pump my eye and I thought, oh, I'd love to be like him. And I was obsessed with like big muscles and being strong and boxing. Then I watched the Rocky films, I got the gloves made and the hat and I was running up the hills and you know, as a kid, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. you know, we all do it. But when I was a kid, there was no there was no drugs about, there was no stabbings, there was no nothing like that. Everyone was into training. It was it's just that way the culture then, but now it's just exponentially ridiculous with these yeah. knives. So do you think that was a trigger point for you, getting bullied? If I become bigger, then it'll exactly. keep people away. Yeah. That's why I like animals like you've seen in my house, I've got big Lines on the front, I've got yeah. like big strong things. I think, you know, like uh, if you're strong, like a lion or a, a silverback and things like that, you obviously you're not going to get bullied type of thing. So yeah. I got into the weights, but um, it was funny because my, my uncle Tam he owed my mum a few quid and he couldn't afford to pay, so he gave me an old set of weights, it was just like a rusty set of weights, a couple of dumbbells, and it was uh, a bench made with an old bit of carpet nailed on and pieces of wood. And mm -hmm. I started training after a few years, then I moved from there to Red Car. I started training when I was 18 properly and I, come, I, I trained for two years in a little gym that, that down there called the Chapel Gym. It was called the Chapel Gym because it used to be a church. So we were in there training and then uh, I competed for the Mr. Uh, England under 21. I come fifth in the show, but I didn't really know. I never took a steroid or nothing. The, the other lads who compete were taking steroids. I did that. I did a few more shows. I come fifth. Then I started getting into, I got a job on the door, working on the doors. The first door walked, worked and was in uh, red car, Leo's, and I got that job and I was a little bit scared because I, oh, I can fight, but I don't know, I don't know, put people out and things mm. like that, you know. And I'd called Jeff Robinson, Frank Yathen looked after me. And then in them days, because it was on the sea front, if you had a, if you could call a straight there, like out in Scotland, square go, they call it in Scotland. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we'd go on the beach and have a fight and whoever won, won, shook hands and that was finished with. But now it's petrol bow in your houses, yeah. bloody stabbing you. It's just... It's Travel just, stuff. Yeah, anyone carries a knife to coward because they yeah, can't fight, you know? Definitely. Is, um, so, when did you start getting into the fighting and when, how did your reputation become so fierce? What happened is when you start, when you're working on the door, you start working the door and he, he'll come in, he'll have a fight, yeah? He, he, I'm the best fighting Gisborne, this lad said, which is a little town not far from here. And anyway, I knocked him out. I said, I guess I must be the best fighting guys now. Were you and, doing uh, boxing training at that point? I started training with a man called Frank Yathen. He was a pro boxer. He was about 60 odd. He was a bit like Mickey and Rocky type of thing. And yeah. I stayed at his house and we used to run up the sand dunes. And he had, he had a, a dog called Max and Sam, two Labradors. We used to go run with the dogs. And uh, I used to train. He showed me how to box, you know, how to throw punches and everything. So it's not all about the big massive punch, it's the speed and how you move. and mm -hmm. You know, agility movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he said, what, when I did a book by a man called Julian Davis, and he interviewed 300 fighters across right across Britain, and he had me on the pads out the back, and he, he, I was hitting the pads, and he went, fucking hell, he said, 
you can't be that big and be that fast. You just defy the laws of physics. He said, you're just phenomenal. My hand speed and, uh, and the way I moved and that, you know, for my body weight and that, he said, they're phenomenal speed. So Yeah, because you, you've got a rep, because they say, I spoke to a few people and they says that you, you had the potential to become Britain's strongest man and a potential heavyweight champion. Yeah, so yeah. So you had yeah. that potential. So. I, even, I even had a chance of being, um, do you remember, you might be too young, but I think uh, that the, the the British Bulldog. Yeah, he was wrestler. a wrestler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Danny, yeah. Danny something, something Smith, I think he was called. I could have been a tag partner with him, but it's got a blow all. And I also got a chance to go. What up. happened? Drugs, different things, getting into fights, going into jail, things like that, you know. I, I had another chance to play for the Miami Dolphins as a, I don't know if it's a running back or whatever you call it. There was, yeah. one, there was a one called The Fridge years ago. He was 26 stone, but I, I weighed 24 stone. I was really fast at running. Um, and they had a chance of doing that, and blew. I had a chance of three movies with, Mac, um, with a lad called Tony Nunn. He had Stanley Baxter, he had Diana Dawes, he had Jimmy White and Tony Mio, all them type of people. And he found me, he said, I want you, I'm going to make you a star. And he had me in a film called The Giant, and I'm going around going FIFA five film type of thing and, <laughs> and, and all that. And I blew it again through the drugs. It'd just been a fucking dickhead, you know? Do you think when you were getting these opportunities, do you think you never had the confidence to grasp one? Because maybe you were getting bullied back in the day, so it was easier to hide no, away th from the drugs. No, I think what it was, I think it was just I was addicted that bad on the drugs. And uh, in 2006, my brother hanged himself. Um, he was on heroin. We used to we used to go mad with him, saying, "What are you taking that rubbish for? What are you taking for?" But we didn't know he'd been raped as a child, and uh, that destroyed me. I was just like, "I should have done this for him. I should have done." It. You know, you blame yourself for everything. Mm -hmm. So. That got worse, 2006, and uh, I was with my girlfriend for 17 and a half years. She walked out on me, obviously with the drugs, and she went. Uh, my dog had for 13 and a half years. He died. Mind you, I probably missed the dog miss more than the missing missus. I say that, I, yeah, I, I say that all the time. That <laughs> and I've lost more. Yeah, better, I've there. lost a lot of people, but yeah. when I lost my dog, my boxer, well, yeah, I met it, it, it was unbelievable. It was a most heartbreaking thing. Should we not thing. Yeah, relate yeah, some yeah, yeah. yeah. it's 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 dogs weird. over humans, anything? Of course, they is. But it's the loyalty, of course, any it is. animal, because if you've been done wrong in your life, if you've been maybe bullied yeah. mentally, physically, yeah. Your dog's your companion. That's it's right, the only life, thing that puts a smile on your face. Yeah, it doesn't speak back. No. It's just, they're amazing animals. I've yeah. always wanted to get another dog or two, but I've I got, feel as if that's my loyalty. I've got one upstairs. Yeah. He's that big. <laughs> He's monstrous. He's a Dominican <laughs> cater, but yeah, he sleeps on my bed every night at the bottom of the bed with me. Marvellous. Yeah. Yes, you know, it's a brilliant company. So so when did you start, when you got the reputation of the tax man, how did that come about? Well, what happened, um, We I, I was fighting, and I started fighting a little bit for money and things like that. And how much? Few, couple hundred quids in here and there and I bet you couldn't beat him and Pete would come down you'd, you'd fight in one one nightclub and then I'm going to fight I'm going to get my brother and then his brother would come and another one would come and up. so your reputation you're going up the ladder you see because you're beating more and more people so I'd beat everyone but in the North East nearly and then I started working the doors for John Black who was a, who was a good boxing trainer and uh, there was a lad called Lee Duffy he, he was in jail all, in that jail all the time and I was 26 but I was probably like 21 in the head because I was a, just into training. I didn't know nothing about drugs. Didn't know I wouldn't have been in trouble with the police or nothing. Bad me. And uh, he was walking down the street. And I was with a lad called Kev Kilt and he was with a lad called John Fail. And this Lee Duffy's phenomenal name. Everyone knew him. And John said, Oh, he'd probably be good friends with you. So me, gullible, goes up to talk to him and shake his hand. And as I'm going to talk to him, I'm stood square on. And if you square on, you get eight, you're going to fall on your ass. I've learned that all stands side on now if you talk to someone. Anyway. His mate had a bottle of pills in his hand, so I turned and looked at him and said, he made me a left oak. And people said, did, 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 did it hurt? I said, i seen more stars than Patrick Moore. I said, so mm -hmm. I said, I went down, I got that flash, like a, like a, 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 like a, like a lightning flash type of thing or a welding flash. But I, I got out of it anyway, he tried to grab me, but I was, I was 24 stone, he was about 15 and a half stone, and I just, the strength, I picked him up, smashed him into the wall, head butted him, got him, had him beat, his mate hit him in the head with a bottle, I threw him out the way. We got broke, broke up. I came back. I went looking for him all over, chased him different places. And in the end, he phoned me up. He said, look, Brian, you're hanging around with loads of assholes. He said, I'm, I'm going to apologise for that day, what happened. He said, can we team up? And we'll go taxing. I said, what's taxing? He said, come with me. I said, what if I get in your house? There's 20 of you waiting for me. So I went with this lad called Mark Miller. There was another lad called Neil Boo that was there, who's Lee Duffy's friend. And we got together and probably, I'm not being big at it, we were probably the best two fighters in the country at the time. He was going to fight Lenny McLean, and Lenny McLean backed off on the fight. Uh, 
so we teamed up together so it was like this massive tag team type of things where no nobody could beat lee and nobody could beat me in the area so so lee duffy had the fearsome reputation but he was became your best friend he ended up being my friend um, he was taxing all the drug dealers we, we started, we, the first day i went out with him i went to his mum's house in south bank and uh he was sitting down putting his shoes and he looked up at me and went i must be fucking crackers look at the size of him though because i was 24 stone huge and uh, he said he shook me hand. He said I was, I, yeah, I was an asshole. I had to shook me hand. Anyway, we went out, made fifteen thousand pound in a couple of hours. You know, I thought fuck it. I was doing the doors. I was I had about eight doors. I was making about three hundred quid a week. I thought fuck the doors, you know, like that. So, so that's where it all case started. started. Off, yeah, we just, but your friend Lee, he was brutally murdered. He was yeah. yeah. How long after you became friends? Well, I was with him for nearly four months, three and a half, four months, and I had a fight with the big lad. It was bull I, one thing I can't stand is bullies. As a because of your past, bullied, yeah, and I seen four doormen beating a, a kid on the floor. But anyway, I knocked two of them out, and the police come and arrested me. Anyway, they put me in a van, but I was that strong. I kicked the van door, the hinges off, jumped back out the van, and then you know, get me in the van, kicked another van door, hinges off. So I got a nick for that. Anyway, I seen this like a couple of days later. I knocked him out. Now I went on remand, and while I was on remand, Lee was stabbed to death. But he'd already also been shot twice before that. So and somebody had. This is how pathetic this is. It's like you throwing petrol on me now. I right, a gallon of petrol would be in a bucket and you're trying to get a light. So I punched it to stop you from lighting it. And Lee got charged for, for breaking the lad's draw, jaw, who tried to set him alight. So no self-defence. Yeah, yeah self-defence. He, he was on remand for that. So, mm -hmm. But he got he, it was four attempts on his life and suddenly he got stabbed um, off a lad called uh, Davy Allenson. So when you were in prison at that time, how did that affect you? Well, it's funny enough because the lad who threw the petrol on him was next door to me, padded up. So mm -hmm. things went weird that happened. He shouted up. It was a Sunday morning. He said, Sunday, he was going on a visit. He shouted, Bri Big Bri, he said, uh, Lee Duffy's been stabbed to death. I thought, fucking hell. Mm -hmm. like, like, gutted. I tried to go to the funeral, but they wouldn't let me go. So, yeah, it's yeah, only family so, members. So, yeah, then, then it was me on my own. So when I come out, I was like, ah, that fuck him. Look at what they used to say to me. We'd go to the doors and I was at, he had the key. He said, what do you mean you've got the key? I said, well, size 12 feet, this is the key to get the door in. Because in them days, I'd just keep the door off the hinges. I wouldn't go into those kids. I wouldn't go if there was like, nothing, had animals or kids or children, uh, uh, women. But if it was like three or four lads in the house, five or six, didn't, I didn't care. I'd just kick the door in, run and tax them, take the gear off them. Yeah. But I always used to take the shoes off them so they could run away. That was one of my little tricks. Yeah. And... um and we'd, in them days, it was cannabis mainly because it was it was the early nineties, you know. Cannabis the, ecstasy, not really ecstasy until well. later on the ecstasy because the ecstasy didn't come up here till about, but there was ecstasy, but it wasn't there wasn't a lot of money in it. Yeah. So what what happened is um, we'd go in the house and uh, I remember Lee in one house because you have some funny laughs. He kept stepping over this carpet saying, "Where's your fucking drugs?" And he was going, "I've got no drugs, Lee." And he gave him five thousand acid tablets. She was going, where's the drugs? He kept stepping over this carpet. Anyway, when he left, there was 10k of cannabis under the carpet. <laughs> so you can't see the wood for the trees type of thing. So some things are funny. So see, when yeah. you came out, did you feel as if there could have been a hit out in your life because you became friends Oh, there was friends people that killed me all over. I mean, I went for a fight at Redke with some lads. There was about 30 of them come out. Six of them had handguns shot at me. They all missed me. My mate behind me got shot. He weighed 12 stone. I was 24 stone at the front, charging them like at the Battle of uh, well, the English and the Scottish, you know, on yeah. them, them fields yeah. like them. So I was charging, charging guns. And he's fucking crackers, him. But I thought they were just. Uh, Do you, you have a death wish then where you were fearless wasn't I was of a, death? Uh, yeah, I wasn't bothered. Still, still not bothered. Let me see. Another, another time, I'll come up the blues. It was like a rave, mm -hmm. like a rave type club for like black, black, black lads and that. And it was in there. Uh, one of my friend ran to the lad come with a shotgun, stuck her on him. I jumped in the middle and the gun was on me, the shotgun. I went, now then, shoot me. Fucking shoot me. Don't bother me, I'm going to die. Once I'm dead, I don't think about it. I said, but all these witnesses, hey, I'm going to jail for life. And he just turned and run. But when you think what could happen, obviously you could have been killed, you know what I mean? But So I then when you were taxing people, Brian, how did you pick the people that you were taxing? Was it the right. serious criminals who were making the most money? Or was it petty criminals? How no, was no, that? no, no. It was anybody. Who had anybody I didn't anybody give, that had didn't money? Give, didn't give a fuck mm -hmm. who they were, how big they were, how many people they had, how many guns they had. I wasn't bothered. And most of the times I'd do it by myself. I'd have a girl in the car with me and I'd just go and take the money off, throw the gear off them. But um, sometimes I, 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 you'd go in, you'd fight. I remember going to one house, there was six, eight or nine black lads, end up knocking six of them out in the house. 
and I took all the money, the gear off them and the drugs and everything. But then other times you've walked in and you've I, I lined seven of them up to search them all, come out with the fiver. <laughs> so sometimes you got now and another time I went to a caravan. I knew the sled of the caravan and I went in and I found thirty six thousand pounds with the the, the uh, speed because you can smell it's like cat piss the smell. And uh, we've had kilos of coke to, taken off them. And I'll, I'll tell you this because I've been nicked for several offences that nobody else had been nicked for. We allegedly taxed a lad from Nigeria bringing heroin into the country or cocaine, one of the two, uh, and we took it off him, allegedly, uh, a gunpoint arm robbery, and the police come and arrested me. There was 17 in them days. It was only, there wasn't no helicopter then, it was just the aeroplane and the company house, and uh, they, they had the uh, Zuzi troopers and were all stood behind the thing and they had the... Different guns than they've got now, and they're saying, Come out, I'm police, I'm police, screaming, shouting. But you can tell because they've all got Irish accents because they're all like SES or they're all Alex Army type of thing. Anyway, I came out and got arrested for an uh, armed robbery of a drug deal and bringing drugs from Nigeria into England, going to sell them and then taxed by me and another couple of people. So I was charged with it, I was taken in, and uh, the lad never picked me out of the lineup, but uh. We went to court and the judge said, this can't go to court. He said, he's bringing drugs into the country as a drug dealer and they've took it off him. Who's the worst? It's just, it's not going to yeah. be able to The judge kicked mm -hmm. it out. So, yeah, yeah ridiculous charges. So, you know? obviously, anybody that's involved in a life of crime, they're always, there's always, I believe anybody can, can be got, anybody's capable yeah. in their own day. So, if you're taxing people, were you, was it a set wage or were you just taking their gear and money? Just not giving a fuck. I'm just taking everything, mm -hmm. even fucking like, like an ornament, like that picture I took, like that picture I took. Mm -hmm. You know, certain things like that. Just if they, if those scumbags I've taken, I've, I've gone to houses where I've taken drugs off people and I found out the good lads and they're only selling a bit of blow and been that. But when they're selling heroin and crap and and they're, they're yeah. selling the kids and things, like that, they just want they want taking. What them happened again. the time you get set up? You went to a house and there was twelve people waiting for you. What happened is. I'd tax somebody in one of the raves, and like you say, I've had quite a few people. I've had another. I've had a few try to shoot me when I've got away. You know, uh, I go to this house, Ormsby Bank. Tommy Harrison's a friend of mine. He says, "Hey, can you come and see me?" But little did I know they had handguns and shotguns to their heads, and there was about twelve of them in the house. So I goes to the house, knocked on the door, lad, come to the door. He said, "You, Brian?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Oh, I'm here, mate. I said, come in. I've got it in the head here. I've got." The, like my legs hanging off here, there's the scars on me. I've got machetes all over me, stabbed in the back, stabbed, stabbed in the front. But I was fighting for my life, so people said, Were you scared? Fucking course, I was scared. I, I was going, they were trying to kill me. And I got told off a man called Phil Berryman they wanted to kill me. And he had a boat, and they were going to put me on the boat and put me out to sea and dump me in the sea. So they all come together, you know the story. But the people who attacked me. When they were all big, big lads, big, big, big hitters, not like little fucking idiots to big, big time uh, gangsters. Um, I threw them all over. There was a couple of big heavyweight boxers there. Um, I dropped a few of them. Anyway, I fell on the floor and they started hitting me with machetes and chopped me up. And But they battered me with baseball bats. Have you ever seen a film Casino and the beat? Yeah, yeah, the end of, yeah, the with, with, yeah, that exact scene is that. Never brought one bone in my body because I was that big. It was like it cushioned it, so. But the thought, the, the thought was going to lose my leg. Um, the, the doctor, she was only twenty-seven. I fell in love with her. She was beautiful. She was American, and she said we might have to amputate your leg from. I thought well, you might as well just put me under. I said uh, so. She, she she saved my leg, but uh, yeah, that was a scary situation. But close as I come to death because I lost three pints of blood and had one hundred and seventy-six stitches. But I thought fuck yous. And when they, when they were doing me, I was on the floor. I said, "You better fucking hide, because I'm coming for every fucking one of yous." Mm -hmm. And I still tell them now to this day, you know. And five of them were in that house have died, been killed, and the other ones have been set about and been done in. So mm -hmm. I've had my revenge type of thing. So, so see that in your life, where you're kind of that was, you can see where the other flip of the coin that you do that to people. So when it happens to you, do you feel anger or do you just accept it to go? No, well, it's that's just what I do. Parcel of what yeah. it happens at the end of the day. The police come and they want me to make statements. I wouldn't make a statement. I said, all we need is a blood sample. Nobody will know. I said, I'll fucking know. And you'll know. I said, I, I don't do my statements. So they were saying, oh, we'll, we'll give you 100 grand because these were big time gangsters, you know, really big. And they were, they were up for the bed, obviously, because they hit me on the head with hammers and, and put guns to my head. And I said, listen, if you if you want to... Uh, what happened is the lad who got, he got remanded and a couple ended up being friends with the people because it was a bit like you saying to me, Brian, I've been jumped by 20 lads. 
what it was, they had a fight and I beat him and I broke his jaw in six places. And he said I jumped him with all the lads and what happened? I allegedly went into a nightclub. We are supposed to have went in with Uzis and machine guns and handguns and all sorts of 80 people. Got ball cutters up the back door, come in, they had the fight with this professional heavyweight boxer, I beat him. And he told a lot of bullshit saying I jumped him with all the lads, so they've done tit for tat. So I didn't really was bothered about them. So I went and seen the lad. Because when they come out in the house, Tommy Harrison's, they were seen by uh, sorry, off-duty policemen and they took the registration and anyway they got caught on the A19 and they got remanded. So they're on remand for attempted murder on me. But I went to court and said, we're not going to do with me. I said, they're my mates. He said, well, how come your blood's in there? I said, not my, how can you prove it to my blood? Anyway, they said, well, we can make you give a sample. I said, well, I'll tell you how the blood's in there. I was at his house. I was boxing with him. We were doing a bit of sparring. He bust my nose. I told the blood's in his jeep. So my statement got them off. So they come down to kill me. And end up going to court and getting them off, and that wasn't the whole fear. It's just the respect I've got. Yeah. How you know? did the the McIntyre's underworld come about? Because that's what kind of gave you the reputation, and yeah. everybody kind of got to know you by then. Well, what happened? I did, I did a book by Julian Davies, who uh, interviewed about three hundred fighters. I was telling you about, and he went across them all, and he he had me on the pads with Richie Horsey, you know, the little legendary fighter from Hartlepool. And he said, uh, he said, I've interviewed three hundred odd fighters, but there's only one Brian Cockrell. He said. Every hundred years or so, someone like him comes around. He's got hand speed. He's got power. He's got solid chin. He's got ability. He said, the thing he's got in abundance is his intelligence. He said, most people who are big and heavy, they're like, ooh, 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 like big caveman type, you know, <laughs> big, thick, thick and doors, you know. But, uh, yeah. How was the documentary then when you did that? Did I, had you to, I had to watch what I was saying. Obviously, I, it yeah, was. Yeah, incriminate it, yourself. People saying, well, how can you say you were done for murder? Well, I was done for murder, but got off of it. Yeah. So it's just, it's like saying, well, I killed Tommy Jenkins and I buried him in the back garden, and then they'll go and find the body. So I'm going to get caught, obviously. But if you've been charged for something and you go up and the evidence is dropped and they haven't got enough evidence against you, you obviously you can talk about it or it was alleged on the street or it was said on the street. It's totally different. Did he give you a run through or anything? Or was he just want information? Was he not caring what you were saying? Even if you incriminated I, yourself, or you have no, to be no, careful. No, I, I, I just was. It was alleged. It was alleged. Mm. That, like the police would say, yeah. you know, just, just. I'm really, really clued up in the law, but yeah, it was just. It was said on the streets. I'd done this and done that. Just like the time when I, the two police, took the police were chasing me. They used to chase me every day for fuck all for no reason whatsoever. But they couldn't catch me because I was, I, I was full group and rally driver. Uh, rally driver. I was top, top of the. Age How driver. many times were you charged with murder? I got, I got charged. I'm being questioned about. 13 times for murder. 13 but, different murders? Yeah, but I've been charged for seven. And I got charged for two attempted murder on two police officers. They said I tried to run them off the road and kill them. I said, so right, you're saying I've, I'm trying to kill you. So if, did my vehicle strike your vehicle? They went, no. I said, so how can it be attempted murder? I said, did, did, did you get injured? Is there any marks on you? Is there any injuries? No. So I got kicked out. So I've represented myself half a dozen times in court and won the cases. You know, it's just some of the things are just made up. And some of the charges, I mean, I got done for a, another uh, attempted murder. I went to see a friend in Thornaby and he, he copies the DVD to me for the kids, you know, of the, the tax man and the, 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 the ones when I was going for the world's strongest man. And I went to see him and as I was in there, there was a shooting around the corner from where, where I was. So as I come out these flats, it was a big block of flats, a couple hundred people live there, you have to push the buzzer, you're on camera. But there was a... Uh, 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 it was a Stockton Borough Council meeting because the flats were getting done up. They were changing the kitchens and the formats and stuff and things like that. So it was 50 people there identified me. So I was on camera. So I comes up, up to my house, police car behind me. I thought, yeah, what's she after? Anyway, do you want me? She went, no, no. So I come up the house, drove to the petrol station, got some petrol. And he had a young lad who used to stay, used to call his dad, but I've, 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 I've adopted, like, not adopted, but I've took in 30, 40, 50 different kids over the years who've been run away from home and they've had nowhere to live. I've had them stay with the social services and things like that, you know. And uh, he was staying here and uh, he, he was in trouble for a snowball fight. Anyway, the next minute we hear this, day, 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 day. The next minute, four. It's always the SES come for me now. It's all, all the blacked out uniforms. And it's on, if you look on the uh, R R R Thornaby, Redcar Road, Thornaby, You'll see there was 33 armed response, 68 police involved in this, and they pulled me on, on, on a road just around the corner. Armed response, armed response, and he was looking through the gun close to the dew. He kept looking through there and looking at me. I went, listen, mate, you're in the wrong fucking game. I said, if you can't shoot me from that distance, you want to pack in, you want to get a different job. 
So anyway, I'm police up screaming at me and screaming. I went, will you stop shouting? I said, I'm not 20 mile away. I said, my mum shouts a lot worse than you and I've had more good ads off my mum than you would ever give me, mate. And she frightens me a lot more than you. So anyway, he didn't like it anyway. He was doing me, I didn't, and he had my hands up. And my dog was really vicious, Charlie, he, on the McIntyre. He was trying to bite you here. The boxer? The yeah, he fucking hated the police. I said, why is that dog always barking at us? I said, he's fucking sick of getting pulled over by his. Anyway, um, what happened is they arrested us for it, for the murder, for attempted murder. Somebody took, somebody got shot, so they took us. And then what they're doing now, they split you up. See, there's four of you. One of them got to Stockton Police Station, one got to Middlesbrough, one went to Hartley Paul, and I went to Redcar. Now, Charlie was only in the cells two hours. I said, the dirty bastard, the dogs blew us up. He's only been in two hours. He's got bail. He's, he must have made a statement you know, the box. <laughs> so anyway, we were in the cells 23 hours, something. You can only do 24 hours. Then after that's for, for, more, for more time. So they said, well, we've got two witnesses. Um, witness one says, this was meant, this was supposed to be my, my resemblance to me. Five foot seven to five eight. I said, fuck it, I must have lost some weight. Medium built to talk, uh, medium built to slim, ginger hair to press freckly scale. How the fuck is that supposed to be me? And where's the mention of the dog and Miguel friend? I said, why would I take Miguel friend, the love of my life, my stepson and my dog on an armed robbery and shoot someone, then go back two hours later and drive around with the big red flags and here's Brian Cockrell. I said, it doesn't make sense. So anyway, I said, I want a forensic, path. I want a forensic, um, uh, scientists in here now to do a powder residue test as you know what they are don't you yeah, Where, for, the shit for, gun. for the shit and the gun yeah so I've had, I've had seven of them so they've done all the stuff she said bye you're confident I said I haven't done it anyway it gets sent off to Weatherby come back four hours later it's not him so they took me in the police station asked me where I went told them where I was I was on camera there was 50 witnesses and they had me on bail for nine months and uh, the lad got shot they come in they said uh, I've got your bad news, Brian, the lad's died. He said, you're getting charged with murder, so... But it was just bullshit lies again, though, so it never happened. Yeah, but again, that's the inconvenience because of all the shit that you have done. Yeah, yeah. They just... They cut what, your door every day, they bug your what, house, bug yeah, your car. Of course, car. They do, yeah, of course, yeah. They bugged my car. We found the bug. We went to Leeds. My mate mm. found it. He was ex -SES. He found it for us. Um, I got nicked for another murder. A lad called Dougie Manders, who was killed. And they're coming from murder squad. Uh, you've done this to him. You've done that. I don't even know the kid. Um, they pulled me in for that murder. Um, they pulled me in for a murder when I worked on the door with somebody 20 years ago, didn't even know him, but from Luton he'd been shot. They pulled me in for that. Um, they've questioned me over different different other murders. They pulled me in for a lad. Was A lad had been text, because this is another problem I have, um, James, because you've got that big name, that big persona, I'm going to get Brian Cockrell. I mean, I was working on the door once, and four lads come in, I knocked three of them out. Anyway, they went, I'm get me fucking brother. He's going to kill you. My brother. I said, who's your brother? He went, Brian Cockrell. Mm -hmm. So they were threatening me with me. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you just, you, you can't stop stop that. So anyway, the, the, the police had come to arrest me um, over murders because of the people using my name, you know. It's mm -hmm. just, just, just. How were you dealing with that then? Were you still bang on the drugs? Yes, you'd go on it and you know, they could one night and I'd just come off it and just got rid of the pipe and everything. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I think, fuck for that, you know, yeah. like, but the nick me. The, the, but when they come, it's ridiculous. I remember when they come one night, they're all this idea. They had all the riot shields banging them all. I, I got out the window and I went, nah, I'm fucking Spartacus. And they went, he's fucking crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? He doesn't give a fuck, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I went, come on, come in the house. I've got something for you. Like, and they just stood on the front. And I remember they decided to get me for a kidnapping once. And, uh, I was supposed to kidnap someone to come to the house for me, and it was in Roseworth. And when I was there, I used to have, I've always had dogs. I had a big, massive Rottweiler. He was huge. But it was like a council house with a little alley, you know, where you can get through. So I said, let Ben out in the back to my girlfriend. Anyway, Ben went all the back and they all run on the front. So I went and got over the back fences. What, they went everywhere, the cops were fucked. So I laid down on the side of the fence. Wait, wait, were you as well? 23 and a half stone. <laughs> so I'm just laid down the side of the fucking, I'm just, I'm just laid down the side of the fence and they're going, I don't know where he is. I was right under his fucking feet. If he'd have walked one foot and he'd tripped over me. But you just get looked on you sometimes, you know. Anyway, and we re-kidnapped the lad again. And made him go to the police station when I got I went and myself in and he went to the police station. Oh, he never kidnapped me, I was full of drugs, don't blab him. So I got my charges up. So yeah. Do you count yourself lucky that you're still alive today, Brian? Yeah, I, I suppose I do. But I look at people, Bleed Duffy used to say to me, Brian, you aren't going to make 28, 27, where you're going on. I said, because you just don't give a fuck, mate. He said, I've I've been with some people in my lifetime, I fought the hardest people in the country. And he said, You just don't give a fuck. He said, I don't know where you get it from. It's not you're not crackers. You just have to don't give a fuck. He says, we spoke earlier 
and obviously I've watched your documentaries, read the book. Yeah. Um, speaking to Jamie Boyle, who's writing your, your other books, so That's shout right. out to Jamie. Yeah. So you're expecting to come here and you're just a big fucking lump. Yeah. Not very well educated. I know you said you weren't at school, but we've spoke about things in there that I was surprised with. Guys like Joe Dispenser, right, all yeah. about the yeah. mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the stuff that you've done with law, fighting your own cases. Yeah. It's quite surprising, Brian. I'm not going to yeah. lie, mate. No, you're, no. you're on the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. But again, even though we can educate ourselves on some things, when you're going to court and stuff, you've been lucky, not been lucky, but if you find your own cases because you've, you've, you've got away with the majority. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I've only, I've only been to jail for dangerous driving. Yeah, so, so you've got away I, with them all then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, but there's never been no evidence on witnesses. Yeah. I they had one case with 15 witnesses against me, but the day of the trial, all the witnesses went missing. They all went away and all of a sudden, well, I haven't got a clue where they went, but they all went, they all went so the case was kicked out, so things like that but most of my stuff is fighting you know it's fight fight and things like that I, I remember i was on i was on bail for five years not one day was i off for that charge that would get another charge out and then they had me i had to stay in the house you know like a house arrest type of thing every night i'd be in at six o'clock they'd come four or five times a night i'd sit out there outside all night long you know, just that's how much they wanted me did you take steroids at any time yeah yeah to be 24 stone you yeah, must yeah, have took yeah, something yeah, i took steroids yeah i took the steroids um but uh, they're not the be all and end all i mean i'm over 20 stone now but yeah. nothing you know what i mean so, so in your documentary i watched you were eating like 12,000 13,000 calories a yeah, day yeah yeah how did you fuck did you consume all that you just you what you do is you could consume a lot of it through just drinks, you know, like like yogurt drinks and protein mm. drinks and porridge. Yeah, but like you that. were waking up at three in the morning. You were eating oh, yeah. toasties yeah, and baguettes. Yeah, yeah. Well, ice cream. Well, that, that that was only on there. That was only for like a holiday. I don't eat that crap all the time. Yeah. Obviously, I eat a lot of protein drinks with porridge in. Because obviously, mm -hmm. it's a Scotch porridge. Us. I remember one of the you will remember this film. Uh, remember Wee Geordie? Yeah. That was my yeah, favourite yeah. film. And he was walking, he was dead little, and, and he got the pamphlets, and he was getting bigger every month, and the <laughs> stairs was shaking. That was one of the films that got me into weight training, you know? So I just wanted to be big and strong, you know? Because I was always, I had, I had asthma as a kid. I was bullied as a kid. So I was a little weak, like a little bit the runt of the, the later type of thing. So what's your best fight you've ever, bare knuckle fight you've ever had? You've yeah, had yeah. over a thousand. So what one stands out to you? Go. I wouldn't say about that. a thousand bare knuckle fights. I think I've had a thousand fights within yeah. clubs and pubs yeah, and things. Yeah, yeah. I probably, probably put about 2,000 people out. I've had <laughs> like, 2,000 people out on the doors. You don't, yeah, you yeah, talk, yeah, yeah. you've got to remember this, Jim. I, I was working off 40 years, you know what I mean? So, so working the doors 30 odd years and I was working like 40 doors. So when you're working like in 40 different clubs, you're fighting every single night. Do you night. think because you loved fighting that much, that was like a, a it, license to fight? I think Back then, then I, yeah, yeah, you I could think get away well, with it nowadays, it's all changed, but... Yeah, no, you, you can't even just shout at anyone now, you, you get yeah, charged. it's all licensed know? and... Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, what it was is people wanted to fight you, and that's what it was, because everyone was at the training and wanted to be the fighting, the boxing and all that stuff, mm -hmm. so... But you get beat, you'd win, you'd lose, you'd draw, whatever, you know. I mean, I, I've had fight. I had a fight with a lad called the, the, the Gypsy Lad. He was six foot eight, a bit like Tyson Fury. No one ain't as good as his fight, type of fighting, but he was a top fight in the country. He had 300 fights. They called him the dentist, and he used to hit you with a big right hand. Knock all your teeth out, and you'd have to go to the dentist. That was his nickname. So he tried this with me. With the Spenny. Gypsies are tough, tough well, bastards, man. He tried it with me one night in uh, Spennymore, and I broke his jaw in six places, you know. And he come back with a shotgun, and I ran at the car where he had the shot coming out, and I kicked the window and smashed the window and fucked Why up. Why did they come back? Because he got beat. Because he got beat, yeah. But he, 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 even, he even went to the fucking place, and I had to hide in a big, massive fridge with all these hamburgers and stuff on top of me. So the police couldn't find me. That that, that was that was spending money. The top hat. That was the worst place to work. Work. It was full of like, they were like backwards. If you know what I mean. Not trying to be disrespectful, <laughs> but they were all like, oh, I'm fucking the, like Neanderthal, and be like forty or fifty national front skinheads, and they'd be throwing money at us. Like, that wasn't so bad. Then they started throwing stones. I like, fuck this. So I comes out and I drop four, five, six of them. Anyway, he hit this other one. He hit the deck, and I'm, as I'm looking back, looking always looking about, you know. As I'm looking, he gets hit and he falls on his ass and he goes, that didn't fucking hurt. So he gets up and he went across the road and then the car, car hit him and broke both his legs. I shot him, that fucking hurt though, didn't it? And later on, there's a policeman walking by, he said, I thought he was going to nick me. He said, did you hear about that? I got knocked over. I said, oh yeah, I heard about that officer. He said, the funny thing is, the ironic thing is, it was his own car, it was his brother-in-law come to pick him up. <laughs> so the things are just, yeah. things that happen are just mad. And then I remember one night we worked um, Henry Africa's 
and there were seven of us on the door, John Black and Cookie, uh, Gary Russell, Bernie McDevitt, um, 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 Tony Bucko. Anyway, there was about 50 of them waiting for this massive gang of them. And it, and it was my birthday. I was 26 years old. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Charge! And I just fucking ran at them. <laughs> and as we ran at them, they all dispersed. And we make got it in the head. He got 22 stitches in his face, got a brick in his head. But uh, it's chip charge. It was like that, the light brigade. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but so, I just didn't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. When did you, because I know you end up on the crack. Yeah. What age did that happen? I was 26 and had the fight with Duffy. Uh, I went look for him to fight him again. I wanted to have this fight. I tried to fight him. He didn't want to fight me in the end, and he just ended up being friends with me. So we went out and we done a tax with a lad called Craig Howard. We went, we got £700 off this lad called Nipper Harris, the Nip, Nipper, Nipper something. I can't, there's two of them. I can't remember his second name anyway. We were looking for him all day, and all of a sudden we walked past the phone box. He's in the fucking phone box. Go straight in his pocket, £700. £700 then, 30, 30 years ago, yeah, it was a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of money. So of course, well, we'll get some gear, he said. I said, what do you mean gear? I didn't even know what Coke was, but I had heard of it on the telly. I see the, the jaw for them. <laughs> yeah. The, I dig your fucking bullets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm probably like. I <laughs> anyway, so we go to the gate and we got this white powder stuff. He says, have a go of that. So I had to go. And I thought, fucking, now my nose is a bit funny. And then about four hours later, I've gone, a stone fuck all to me, that you know. He went, You've never fucking shut up talking for four fucking hours. <laughs> <laughs> and we were laughing at it, but it was it was good at the time. But then we went to 84 Hampton Street, and it was a last called Nicky Smith. This is in Stockton. And Craig got a test tube and he got it, instead of putting on a spoon like you're doing on bicarbs and all that on ammonia, and he put, put a bit of this bicarb stuff in. He got a bit of a coat hanger and then stab out when they heated it and it. it, it Sticks to the metal, took it off, and then I go that, and then I went fuck, and that was like beating me up, spot, you know what I mean? So off my head on it. So anyway, Lee Duffy was started. Then I thought he's going to fucking start. I was a bit paranoid. Then I thought I'm a bit cabbage there. And he went, Brian, show him how fast you are. Go and get on the pads. So we put took me on the pads, and when you punch, you punch with light hands. You don't try to punch like you bench a five hundred pound because you've got no, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to be, you feel light. My best fight when I was 20, 20 stone 10. When I was 22, 23, I was too heavy. I was out of breath too quick. Too quick. No, I couldn't move. It was good. So 2010 was probably perfect. It's like Mike Tyson when he was 20, he was 15, 7. When he went into 15, 10, he wasn't as fast. So that mm. extra few pounds does slow you down. So anyway, I was on the pads and anyway, trained my lead and that. Anyway, then we went out. So we were on the, on the crack and we were on the pads and that. And then I thought he's going to throw a slight punch here. I thought, oh, fuck it. But if he does, he does, he does. He didn't, he didn't give me a big cuddle. He was off his head. And he went, you know, that day he said, there, you beat me. He said, he said for six weeks, I couldn't sleep properly. He said, my head was battered, knowing that somebody was better than me. He said, there's not a man in this area who can beat you. There's not a man in this country. I don't think anyone can beat you, mate. He said, you've got, the word he come out with is you've got hideous strength. He said, when we went to the gym, he was benching 300 pounds. I was benching 630 he was squatting 250 I was doing eight over 800 so there was a respecter he, yeah he said fucking hell he's just he, he, I wouldn't I, there's, I've done this in all these gyms I've done it in the prisons and everything I've done 850 kilo leg pressing home house it's on the wall I've done 2000 pound leg pressing in other gyms I've brought the, I've brought the weights at the benches and things in, in gyms so I just had this like Samson, one of my other films, like that type of strength. I just yeah. had it. I was gifted. And when I was 22, I could bench 500 pound and I was with no steroids or nothing. So it was just phenomenally yeah. strong. When, because you went off the radar, Brian. What was that because the drugs were taking its toll? Yeah, yeah. What it was is it's like, it's like pop stars. It's like, um, but you get to see after the you know, like the Katie prices and all them, and yeah. they get they get up, right at the top, and them do top films. All of a sudden, then they come down a little bit, and it's not as good. And, yeah. and they're chasing pe people, and they're trying to chase. Like I done a documentary with McIntyre. Did, did that I, shoot I, you into a bit of what stardom? Yeah, like, yeah, a glorify like, kind of gangster yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, which is not good because I don't. It's want, not good. I, I, it's not I good. don't want kids to yeah, yeah, yeah. emulate me. I want kids to emulate me training. I want kids mm -hmm. to emulate me looking after people. Yeah. The thing in this world, the other thing we've lost now is respect. I, I, I think the most important thing in life is it doesn't matter if you're black, you're green, you're white, you're pink, you're yellow, whatever religion you are, it doesn't matter what you are, it's what the person you are, yeah. it's, what, it's how you come across, you know, yeah. what you, your persona is. Because I know we're talking about a lot of your past, but we'll yeah. all touch on the future yeah, and the yeah, stuff yeah, that you're yeah. doing now, which people will be shocked with. Yeah, yeah. But there was a vote, I don't know how this came about, but there was a vote that you were the sixth most feared no, man in the what, world. What, what, what happened is um, Steve Richards, who was 
prolific author. He interviewed people, old mafia, top lads, all he said. I would say this. I wasn't saying it was the sixth hardest man in the world. What he was trying to say there's probably six more, five more people like you on the planet could have done what you've done and survived. And McIntyre said the same. He said, "How you've lived all these years, what you've done, and the times of guns pointed at and everything is just just unbelievable." He said, "We know it's true, but if somebody had written it in a book, they'd think it was made up, you know. But we know yeah. it's true. Obviously, it's in the papers and everything. What's happened to How you? How much money do you think you've spent?" Millions and millions and millions. Yeah. Yeah, millions. I'm not bullshitting you. Honest. Yeah, no, yeah no. honest. I took 250 grand in one week. I flew them on. I took I went, <laughs> went, to, went to these three lads. They were blab, blabbermouths. Oh, you won't do this. You won't do that. So I found out where they lived, where they're done, what dogs they had, where they lived, all the stuff that. And I met them. I said, right, you, I want 20 grand off you. So they went, 20 grand each. But really, I mean, I wanted 20 grand off them. But 20, he'd opened the door for me. And, you know, my IQ is 134. So I thought, of course I want 20 grand each. You don't think I want 20 grand for the three years. So anyway, they were two days later, a day later. So I charged them an extra uh, 10 grand for being late with the money. And they met me. And they gave me, he said, oh, we've got a problem. He said, uh, 20 grand of it, Scottish money. As you know, Scottish money, 200 pound notes, a little red one. So they give me 20 grand. I went, okay, that'll do me, pal. <laughs> because it was, yeah. you know, Scottish 100 pound notes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, was there a lot yeah. of people using you as well because yeah, of oh, your God, name? Yeah, of course, you had of course, money. Of course. People, I used to have All the hanger on. 60 people a day in the door. Well, I've had to go out. Oh, what it is, I've, I've, I need to get the money for the insurance and that. And I'd give, I'd give, I'd see kids in the streets and give them 10 quids and little just kids at the bus stops and gotten out where he's going lads well we'd go nowhere we'd do this way yeah there's 20 quid each or something like just because yeah. i used to think i used to be a little kid you know, you know nice to, to be nice to her but uh yeah i'd have people coming phone calls all the time but we went on the crack uh i'd lend people five grand ten grand twenty grand and then you'd say can you do us a favor and still i haven't got a penny bride i thought i'm gonna do 20 grand and everybody asked for the money back mm -hmm. so like you said when you're, at, when you're at rock bottom yeah you know your fucking friends are yeah. you know the, no the, the fucking the friends people, yeah the, the only friend i have is my sister catherine i was just was top, 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 family's top, always going to be there she's uh um, my brother jamie my mom my dad and my brother uh, bobby they were mm -hmm. probably the only people that were around me that was it you know yeah when was rock bottom for you well, when my girlfriend left me after seventy and a half years, when I was making with the this is a saying, when love when money goes out the win window, love goes with it. But she was all right when I was making tens and twenty grands and coming home, I'll come home with seventy grand and throw it in the bed one night and th like, things like that and <laughs> taking it abroad all over and yeah. buying the this and three hundred pound handbags and all that type of stuff. And she thinks she was one of the Kardashians, you know what I mean? But when the money went out the window, she went. So she she went uh, after seventeen and a half years gone, and then my dog died, and my brother rang him. Said it was just a nightmare, mate. From two thousand and six, it was just they got that bad, you know. So just, uh, well, can I get two hundred quid for a night? And yeah. I'll get a night, and I'll get a bottle of pop and do this and do that. Was that when the drugs were at the heaviest? <laughs> I used to say, say he's a funny analogy of what I said. I said uh, I taxed twenty thousand pounds. And I, I spent £19,500 on drugs and wasted £500 on messages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, though, because you are your hot rock bottom, did your reputation kind of slide with it? Were you still trying to tax people then? Or did oh, you yeah, realise? I was still taxing people, yeah. yeah. I was taxing them, but I didn't give a fuck. I thought well, I was even more. Was that desperate just more then? your habit? Yeah, yeah, habit, exactly. That's another thing when you start selling drugs. You start selling them and you big top of the range cars and all that stuff and I mean it looks great and everything but you've got the police bugging you and you're getting followed people are trying to shoot you you, you, you can't you're looking out the windows you, then when you're selling the drug yeah you know, I'll have a bit I'll have a bit more and you, then you end up being addicted to it so yeah. in the end you're only selling it to, to supply yourself with it you know so for so, the last 10 years Brian you were obviously at your most vulnerable yeah. because the drugs had really taken yeah. toll why was why did nobody try and take your life then because well, I had, a, I had a fight with a, a lad uh, 2011, I think it was. I went down because people asked me who's your heroes. Um, um, George Best, Muhammad Ali, Rocky Marciano. I said, yeah, they're fantastic. My heroes are the servicemen and women who have given their lives for this country over in Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that, and all fighting for our freedom and liberty. They're the real heroes. Doctors and nurses, policemen, even saving people's lives. 
uh, five and things like that. They're the real heroes, you know. But uh, the policemen will probably be watching us yeah. and going, "You lying bastards!" No, 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 no <laughs> you, you, you can't call yeah, all the policemen yeah. because if you if you are, you your house on fire and you've got your kids in there, they'll mm. still go in the house and save your kids. So they're not all bad, yeah. you know. You don't it's get, like any any it's, job, Brian. Every good, good or bad, and bad. Yeah. yeah, exactly, mate. I mean, there was a local Bobby around there once, and he came. He said, "Brian, there's seventeen houses have been burgled." I said, "Leave it with me." Within about three hours, I got all the everything back from every house. And I said, mm -hmm. go to this garage, all the stuff will be there, the car, there's like everything, you know, like that. Can't tell you how it'll do, mate. And then another old woman got robbed her house, all the stuff. I got all their stuff back. And, but you don't hear about the good things you do. You hear about the, the people regurgitate. He's yeah. a gun, he's a bastard, he shot him, he's killed him. So, I've never been convicted of any murders or anything. Mm -hmm. Just fucking... Uh, uh, yeah, just here, say He said, he said, she said, he said, it just goes on forever. But someone, Duffy, said to me, when they're good at talking good about you, you know, all right, but when they're good at talking bad about you, they, then you're in trouble if they're bad at talking bad about you it doesn't really matter because they're full of shit anyway yeah. so yeah. yeah so what was the catalyst then for you to change your life and w open your eyes and go i'm not going to leave my legacy like this i'm not going to die this way i just w when i was when i was <clears throat> i started listening to a man called joe dispenser uh, we just mean you were talking earlier yeah. about him couldn't believe that you you come up with his name because he's fantastic and he says that you, anyone can change your, your mind, no matter how old you are. And I was thinking, because I'd listen to other people and, and they were just regurgitating the same stuff. But his philosophy was ph phenomenal. It just hit me. Hit me, And he, he says things like, don't think about the past, because if they're thinking about the past, it's, they're the bad memories that are making you bad. So you've got to change the process, the process in your brain. So most people get up every day, as you, as, as you know what he says, and you just you get up, they brush the teeth, they put the same cup, they get the coffee, go on the work, do the same thing. So then the body becomes the mind. So you've got to change that then, you've got to change it around. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what the philosophy. So I started realising that um, the concepts, obviously, are thoughts. Or don't be thinking about bad thoughts, think about good things, and don't try to think about tomorrow, or don't think about yesterday, just concentrate on the now. Mm -hmm. And what he says, he says, don't plan for tomorrow but before you get out of bed so have 20 minutes and think right what can i do today to be the best that i can be and what i can do to help people and since i've been listening to with that and following that I've, for the last like say four months i've been doing it for a year but the last four months i've been helping people there uh, yeah. i've saved that um i think it's um six six people's lives in the last eight weeks or so and i've uh got about 200 people to the hospital and got them back in the gym and you go up and think, I've done a great thing there, you know, and I've mm -hmm. got to people's houses, pictures and photos, photographs to be on the Facebook, mm -hmm. where I'm sitting with little babies and uh, going on people's houses and saying, oh, you can do this. If I can do you can do yeah. it. And I was the biggest crackhead in the world. I said, mm -hmm. no, they don't believe me. I know about drugs and it's yeah. a bit of a joke. But I said, but once you're in that, once, once you, like Oscar Wilde says, once you hit rock bottom, you can't hit any further. You've mm -hmm. got to come up. Oh, you can die, so... I that's what you've done. I, Listen to me, I'm going to shake your hand for that because yeah. fair play to you, big man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No matter what you've went through, and I always say yeah. it, nearly every podcast, people can change. Of course. You're a prime example. Lying, dying, full of crack. Yeah. Hating the world because the shit that you've been through, the shit you've been involved in, that's going to play yeah. PTSD, mental yeah. factor. Yeah. So it's easy to slip into mm. drink. I mean, what drugs. people do is they make an excuse. Oh, he's done me anyway, I'm going to have a bit of coke. Yeah. So you, you make yourself... You, you you make your brain think like that think well she's doing my head in there i'm gonna have a bit of gear i'm gonna have a drink so yeah. you, the only person who can do your head in is yourself because mm -hmm. it's you who's thinking yeah you everything's know? in the yeah, thought yeah. process it's like he said joe dispenser people think um eighty thousand 80, 80, thoughts 60 80 thousand yeah, thoughts a day. day but most of the thoughts they have and 90 percent of the thoughts they had yesterday yes and it's the same so thing about the same shit so, every same, day. so if you're going to yeah. keep thinking about the same shit you're going to still mm -hmm. stay in the same shit so yeah. just change it but if you're going through a process of bad thoughts for 10 20 30 years it ain't going to change no, tomorrow no, no, it's no. a long steady process yeah. and you've been working on it for the last year and yeah. probably now you're starting to feel the effects of oh, it yeah, mass, now you're wanting to do your yeah. interviews yeah, yeah. you want to speak in schools i couldn't talk to you yeah, yeah. I, mean, I couldn't have done that you want me. to speak in schools you're, yeah. you're very big on knife crime you want yeah, to bring yeah. it down yeah yeah you want to kind of put something back into the world you yeah. probably but again as long as you've got air in your lungs yeah you've got something to give yeah. So you're clearly here fighting, and yeah. it's showing that you've not quit. You've been no. through a lot, especially with your brother and stuff, your yeah. missus. Yeah. It's easy just to go, it's too much. It, yeah. is, it doesn't yeah. matter. I've seen the biggest men become the weakest yeah. because of certain circumstances, yeah. prison sentences. Yeah. They can't handle that. Yeah. But 
I've also seen people who've been the weakest become the strongest. Yes. And that's yes. the beauty yeah. of life. Yeah. That is an amazing thing. So plans for yourself are moving on then. Now that your head's clear, you're yeah. getting a, another book re wrote that's by right. Jamie Boyle. Yeah, we're doing one on, um, f um, see, I always say healthy body, healthy mind. Yeah. So when, when you train, he's another thing. What well, any doctor will tell you, you, you produce good endorphins, you could set a tone and levels go up and things like that. When do you see a miserable athlete? They're always smiling because they're training and it makes you yeah, feel yeah. better. But the thing is, you have to get your mind right first. The most important thing, once you get that right, the most important thing is your mind and your health. I'd rather have my mind and health than a billion pounds because without your health, you've got nothing. So you can't help no one without your health. So so I'm trying to get people who are sitting about like couch potatoes. I can't do it. I can't do it. Of course you can do it. Just just get up, mm -hmm. go to the doctors, get your heart checked out, get yourself your blood tested and things, and just start off small. And if you're too heavy to train, go to the baths, do a little bit of swimming and things like that, a little bit of walking. Walking. I said one of the best things people pay is thousands for stair masters. You've got your stairs in your house, walk up a couple of steps. Next day, do another few steps, and in the end, you get there. You, you've got to crawl before you can work, mm -hmm. walk. Sorry, so mm -hmm. yeah, we're trying to do that, and we're trying to do the anti knife campaign because there's another kid just been stabbed the other week. Believe it or not, this Teesside is the worst place in Britain for people being killed in the last few years. There's been 19 life sentences given out in the last 18 months here for horrific crimes, so like really, really bad. Because you want to go and speak in prisons and stuff now, yeah. Well, what I'm doing, I'm doing one in the school on um, Thursday. Um, mm -hmm. Kids, naughty kids who, who've been involved with knives and take drugs and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. the teacher said, Oh, I know Brian Cochran. I went, You don't know him, Mr. You, you, and, and every kid in the school knows me. So, mm -hmm. but when I'm not trying to be big headed here, if you go as a policeman, if you go as a probation officer or a school teacher, your class is like the enemy because they're authority. But when you go as me, mm -hmm. I'm just Brian Crockwell off the streets. Yeah. And what I've done, I've done, and yeah, I don't want, talk. I don't want people to emulate me taxing because an average dustbin man. An average shopkeeper makes more money than any criminal because they'll probably make £400 a week. You get caught bag and you get five, yeah, you could have made 100 grand waiting on the bins, you could have made 100 grand waiting for the council. Yeah, the system and, get your money. At the end the, of the, the day, you're in prison and anyone says prison's easy, it isn't. When I went to prison, I was like, oh, fucking hell. It was like that door shut and I was like, oh, fucking nightmare. You have to shit when they tell you, pee when you tell you, eat when you tell you. Yeah. You, you, you can't do nothing. You're in there. It's horrible, horrible. Yeah. How well you in prison over the size of you? through the, the cell door well what it was i'm the only person in people call the history to wear my own clothes because my legs were 37 inches each and i couldn't get nothing to fit me so i had to wear my own tracksuit bottoms so mm. that's another true story every jail i went to you should have there such a cockerel i said no it fits me so but they tried remember you ever seen the film the green mile when he's yeah, massive yeah 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 they tried, to get, me, yeah, they tried to get me the dungarees like him yeah. they still <laughs> they still didn't fit me oh he needs a fucking yeah. banjo to go yeah, with that yeah yeah I said, I said fucking hell i said so they did so i got to wear my own tracksuits in jail you know uh -huh. but uh, they sent me all over i was only in for a driving defense i mean dangerous driving a chase three year uh, Mm. Fucking ridiculous, isn't it? The judge said to me, I'm astonished, Mr. Cockerell, that you haven't been to jail before. I said, well, how can you be astonished when I've been in trouble before? Mm -hmm. So obviously he's obviously been taught the police officers or people. Mm -hmm. I was told them what I am, so... You See, when you did the documentary, though, as well. Yeah. Sorry, I keep going back to that. Yeah, yeah, but sorry. Did that bring a lot more heat on you, though? Not really, because I just told the truth. It was just... Uh, the police could, they couldn't do nothing, because... I'd been charged and beaten the court for these offences mm. and got off with them, you know. But uh, there's, there's, like, the, like, the, like I say, the police, uh, the really, a lot of them are, are all right with me now because I, I, I saved a woman's life on Durham Road. The young kid cut her up and went across the road, smashed it into, the, into a wall. I got out of the car and I thought it was a light, but it was the other bag, the smoke comes out of the airbag. Mm -hmm. And he went, she's 66 years old. It was a birthday that day. She panicked, she collapsed, I brought her back round. Phone, my brother phoned the ambulance, it was a nurse there, she panicked and I stopped the lorries, let the traffic get past him and I stopped yeah. something like that, but you never hear things like that. Another time, me and my brother were driving along in, in a, a, a Zuzi Trooper and it's this man, he was up and down the curbs, I said, he's fucking pissed him, ran him off the road because he's because there was a school with 600 kids coming out and anyway, I tried to get out and he pulled pulled away again. So in the, in the end, I got out and I opened the door and I went to punch him, but I pulled his handbrake on, but I realised... He was an insulin no, a diabetic, and what had happened with it being automatic, the car kept going when he put mm. his foot down. If it had been 
There's another thing that they should do. If you if you if you have ins if you're a diabetic, you shouldn't have a, a, an automatic car. You should have a, a manual car because yeah, yeah. it don't conk out with the, mm-hmm. the, you know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it was all over the fucking place. So anyway, I, I phoned the ambulance, the police come to me and said, like, you, you've probably saved mm-hmm. a potential disaster yeah. there. So so how's the coppers with you now? One lives next door. <laughs> <laughs> In prison off to live there. <laughs> How so? Is, I got one fantastic. Do you get up, yeah. any more grief or? No, no, they don't. But see, when it into the place that they know now, people just use my name. They, 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 they probably at my daughter once or twice a month. You know, for he said she, he said you come around his house. He's doing this. He's done that. But they come one day. They said they're murder squad. I said, oh, fucking hell again. I said, I'll tell you what, it's one murder, I will admit. It was two days after Bin Laden, because yeah, <laughs> I yeah. said, that's one murder, I will admit. It's £300 million reward, mm-hmm. so get my money and I'll admit it. <laughs> Give me the paper. Else. Now, what had happened, some lad had text. A lot, some lad, they broke into somebody, somebody's house and broke, stole £20,000. So these villains, other lads, big, big gangsters, kidnapped this lad but how, on, how they kidnapped him they said it's Brian Cockrell here if you don't come mate we'll come to your house so he shit himself thinking it was me but it wasn't me it was somebody using my name so the last text that the lad got was me and he was found dead in the Red Cat uh, policeman found him in the back of a van dead but they've caught the perpetrators they all got 20 year 20 year each but they uh, that's how easy it is to get blamed for something you yeah. haven't done you know you so know? you want all that behind you yeah it's all gone it's all gone to the and then um, concentrate on getting the next book out, yeah. doing your talks, yeah. um, showing people that you can change, showing yeah. people that. Did you ever have counselling or anything, Brian? No. Someone I, you can I, speak I just, to just, about just, the trauma? Just, just, George Spencer's, I've, 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 I've quite a few psych, psychologists on there, and I think it's just your own mind, isn't it? Yeah, I think you can programme your own mind if you try mm-hmm. hard enough, you know. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah anybody can. So yeah. A lot of medita- meditation, just sitting there. And, I, 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 some people do it, but what you're better doing is get a set of headphones, what you put on, so you can't hear any other noise. Because yeah. if a car goes by, it breaks, it breaks the medication yeah. type of thing. So no, about 20 minutes a day yeah. before I go to bed you know, every, every night. Yeah, so for anybody watching, Brian, who's maybe in the struggle, who's maybe got addiction issues or anger issues or who's thinking about maybe becoming a gangster or a bit of a boy, have you any advice for them? Just please, just I'm begging you, don't do it. I said, because crime doesn't pay. My leader, Feast of Peter Rose, my brother, the Harry Lancasters, the, the Brames, the um, Mark Says, the... Mickey Salters, the, the, I could go on, there's 40, 50 different people I know being stabbed to death or shot to death or do life, you know, it's just not worth it. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is get yourself, if you feel depressed and you have, go and see the doctor, get yourself in the gym, get yourself in a routine where you, you're looking after yourself and uh, educate yourself because there's nothing better than education. When, when you're educated, nobody can take the piss out of you. But if you're not educated, you can't get a job. So get yourself yeah. a decent little job. Even if you went to McDonald's, you're still making a, an honest living. And I'm proud of you going to school. So get yourself the college yeah. or something, you know. So don't try and do what I've done because 95% of them, when I, when I, I'm probably one of the last of the, the old gangsters now, they're all dead. So mm-hmm. oh, they've all done 20, 30 years in jail. It's just not worth it. Do crime feel, crime yeah. does not pay, believe me, in the end it doesn't pay. Do you feel as if you need to shed your light then and try and help others to yeah. rectify a lot of shit that you've done the past yeah, as well? Yeah, you can yeah. sleep easy at night doing good. Of course you can, of course you can, yeah. But, but the thing is, most of my stuff it was what I did as young and daft when you're 20-odd year old, you, you, you go along with other people. But what it is now, that when I was about, there was no knife like there is now. I, I say to people, what, what do you carry a knife for? You're not peeled potatoes, are you? You're going down that town with a knife now. If you were to get into a fight and you're having a fight with someone and you're getting beat, it's over. Yeah. If you've got a knife, you're going to pull a knife and stab someone, kill someone. And when you kill someone, you don't just kill one person, you kill two people, you kill yourself because they're going, you're going to jail for life and you've taken that life's person, that person's life yeah. and you've destroyed two families. Mm-hmm. I, since I asked two, I was in prison, I said to these, I was telling you earlier on, I said, how long was it, the thought, the concept of thought in your head, we thought, I'm going to kill him. He said, two seconds. I said, right. How long was you? He said, two seconds. How long was you before he stabbed and killed him? He said, two seconds. I said, one, two, 20 years. One, two, 20 years. One, two, 30 years. 70 years for six seconds, six, seven seconds. Mm-hmm. And they went, wow, you know, the, the screws and that over there. It's, uh, when you think of it like that, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, take a bigger but if you don't have that knife, yeah. you're not going to use it, are you? Mm-hmm. Simple as that. Well, it's great to see you clean and sober. Yeah. Yeah. And... Your social media, you're on social media now. Yeah, um, yeah. Twitter. On. What's your name on Twitter? 
Jamie Boyle's got it on his Yeah, I'll <laughs> get it. So clever on that. Yeah. I'm on, on there. Um, Brian Cockrell. The, the resurrection of uh, Brian Cockrell. Yeah, on Facebook. Facebook, the resurrection yeah. of Brian Cockrell. Check out for the new book. And yeah. Jamie Boyle, the author, Jamie Boyle, check out his Twitter page. So it was Jamie that kind of helped with this interview. Yeah. Because yeah. this is your first big interview since yeah, yeah, for yeah, a long yeah, time. Yeah, so yeah. listen, Brian, and Joseph, it's been an yeah, absolute yeah. pleasure. Thank Good you, mate, luck with the book and, and keep doing what you're doing. Keep trying to help others. And I will do. Yeah, it's massive respect for that, brother. And but Joe, thank brother. you. Thank you very much. Cheers.